spend a little time here talking about stockmanship and handling cattle, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking, but it's interesting. When I first came out here by myself, before everybody else started migrating, these cattle were all laying on one end of the pen or the other. And it was interesting that as we've all shown up, they've all gotten together. A lot of times cattle are doing things we're not paying attention to. And I've had several conversations about how we just have to be more aware of what they're telling us and what they need us to do to get them to do what we need to get them to do. And so they, they are very inquisitive, but notice that every time I move, they start looking at me. They want to know what I'm going to do. And so everything I'm doing from this point on, or from when I walk through that gap right there, I'm influencing their behavior. And so, so often we get busy and we're in the middle of getting something else done. We don't think about how all this extraneous activity is affecting the cattle and whether or not it's actually making them nervous or not. So when we talk about flight zone and point of balance, those are two of the things we use to get cattle to do what we want them to do because it's that pressure point. Now, when cattle are pretty flighty, and that means you get close to them, they're gonna run off. Uh, that's not a big deal if you're out in a big area because you can always go and put pressure on them and they'll respond to it. But if we don't get that area worked down to where they can take the pressure in this corral, that's when they never are able to see a release of pressure. And training cattle to work good is all about pressure and release. It's no different than training any other species of animal. It's all about pressure and release, okay? So we've got to really make sure that when we put pressure on one of them, they have a way to take that pressure off. And Jesse had one bullet point up there about working cattle slowly. You know, the only way to work them quickly, slowly. That's probably one of the most misunderstood uh, things that we say. Um, <clears throat> so I'll take just a little minute with that. If cattle are really wild, we have to be very precise in our movements. So that when we do something, they understand what we're asking. And so we may have to move very precisely, somewhat slow, and we get a big reaction out of them. If cattle are pretty gentle, we may actually have to make big, bold moves just to put enough pressure on them to where they will move. So you've got everything across the spectrum from some where if you move your hand like that, they may jump to something that you, you could take a pom-pom and throw at one of them and they wouldn't move. So all of those things come into play and we have to learn to read the cattle and understand how to apply that. What we normally see is cattle that are gentle, everybody's real quiet and calm around them, right? You see wild cattle, everybody's screaming and hollering and trying to make them do something. Well, that's additional pressure that they don't need and they can't take that pressure off if you're screaming and hollering at them. That was another point Jesse had was to cut out the screaming and hollering and wailing and gnashing of teeth that goes on when we're working cattle. And I know to start this out by asking, how, how many of you been in a fight with a family member at the cow lot? That's where normally elbows start flying around if their spouse is in the, in the ring. <clears throat> you get to thinking about that. How many of you been in a fight with a hired hand? <laughs> Doc, come on. Not many of us put the same pressure on a hired hand as we do family members. Why? Because they can quit, right? They can relieve that pressure. So a lot of times we put a lot more pressure on our, the people that we're closest to when we're working cattle. And how do they eventually take the pressure off? They leave home and don't come back. So a lot of what we talk about in stockmanship, we actually talk about personal relationships with people and how that plays over into the cow lot as well. And so if we can work cattle better and communicate better what we need to get done, it makes all of this a whole lot easier. We are not very good trainers as agriculturalists. Because how many of you want to hire somebody that already knows everything they need to know? I hear that all the time. I just can't find, I can't hire anybody that knows what they need to know to get this job done. 
Well, if we don't train them, we're the only industry in the world that expects that. Every other industry trains their people once they hire them. And so we've got to get better at training the people we hire in good stockmanship and all the other BQA principles that we like to, to see done on our operation. If not, they don't get done and don't get done correctly. So a lot of this has to do with people management, controlling yourself. A lot of people always get through at this and they say, man, you're very patient. And I am one of the least patient people on the planet. But I've learned that if I have, don't control that, it spills over into the cattle handling. And so I've really got to control my expressions and my actions to get the cattle to work right. So I don't care how laid back you are, or how wired you are. If you can control that, you can get the cattle to work better for you. Now, as I've been down here not really doing anything with these cattle, what have they done? They relaxed, actually went down to get a little feed, no big deal. So as I start going to them, then they're gonna start paying more attention to me. So sometimes if you have really flighty cattle, one of the best things you can do, and, and I've been to Iowa twice in the last four years, I guess, doing these stockmanship trainings. And every time I come, they talk about how wild the South Dakota cattle are that they're feeding over here. Any, any of you South Dakota cattle? In the last place I went to, they were really didn't even want to get them out of the, the confined feeding barn for me to work with, because they were so wild they were afraid we couldn't get them back in the barn. Those cattle weren't wild. They need to come to Texas. We can show them some wild ones. <laughs> they were a little flighty, but then when we worked with them just a little bit, the cattle actually worked very nicely. And they were afraid of people when we first started the process. So, <clears throat> well, there's about four or five things that I think we really need to keep in mind as we start working on these cattle, I'll go over them, then we'll start pushing on cows. We communicate with cattle three or four ways, however you want to look at it. Uh, primarily, it's through sight. So whatever they see, they respond to. Sound is another one. So we can use sound to put pressure on cattle, or as I, I like to use sound to draw their attention to me so they can see what I'm asking them to do. And so I may use a snap of a finger or a cluck or a smooch or something like that, but I try not to ever scream at one of them. This one thing I got off Temple Grand, and when you scream and holler, it has an intent to it. And so you project to somebody and you're talking to somebody, when you start raising your voice, it changes your intent to that person. So you can have a conversation with anybody, but if they start yelling at you, does it change the whole dynamic? It does for me. And so it does for cattle too, horses, whatever. If you raise your voice and it has intent, it can affect things. I tell this, well, I shouldn't do this while we're on camera, but my daughter talks real loud. We have a dog that will not stay in the same room with her just because she talks so loud. If we can get her to bring her voice down, the dog will come in the room. But she just can't stand that much racket. I'm kind of like the dog. I follow the dog every once in a while. Just, <laughs> her voice carries. Bless her heart, she's been told to be quiet her entire life. But sometimes we don't realize how loud we are. And so we have to keep that in mind as well. So try to keep it as quiet as possible. I used to start these and say, if you don't do anything else, when you go home and work cattle, just don't holler. And then some I realize some of you may explode if you, if you can't vent a little bit. So try to keep it to a minimum, we'll say that. So we don't influence the cattle. The other one, uh, touch, we can lay a hand on an animal. If they get close enough, we can touch them and that puts additional pressure and they'll move. We use that in the lead up to the chute quite often or maybe even loading trailers. So we can use that to some extent. The other one where they kind of communicate is smell. The people in the dairy industry really talk about smell being an issue. Uh, hopefully my smell is not ever bad enough it really influences cattle behavior, but uh, you know pheromones and other things are in there. But I don't worry about that one in communicating with cattle and how they communicate. So if sight and sound are our two main objectives, where are those receptors on a cow? Front four inches of their body, right? So eyes and ears. 
So we don't have to worry about the back end of a cow. All we have to do is communicate with the front end and get it to go where we need to go and the rest of it's gonna go. If you think about it, a lot of people you see, they're focusing on driving the body of the animal, not on directing the head. A cow goes where her nose goes, and so if we can get the nose headed the right direction, the rest of it's gonna follow. Just that simple. Five basic things that I think everybody ought to think about as they're working cows. I think they may have been on the screen as well when Jesse was going through that. The cattle want to be able to see you. That goes back to the whole issue with being able to communicate with them. So they, we need to position ourselves where it's easier for them to see us. And if we think about the, a cow in particular, these little yearlings, they can see behind them pretty easy, but a cow is kind of like me and, and an old bull's even worse. They can't turn their head very well. And so if they want to see something behind them, they got to turn their body. Y'all always wonder why granny runs off the road all the time. She can't turn her head. Neck's got too stiff. And so when you turn, your arms go with you. Same thing on cattle. So we can have to worry about that a little bit as we're directing cattle and stay more to the side to the front if we can to get cattle to move. All right, so if they want to see us, the other thing is we put pressure on them, they have a tendency to want to go around us. And that's also so they can keep an eye on us. So when we put pressure and they walk off, a lot of times they will turn. And when they do, that's just because they can keep an eye on us, but most of the time we want them to go straight, right? So if we get them started, we may have to change our position to keep them going straight. And we'll demonstrate all this in just a minute. Third one is, uh, they are a herd animal. So if we can get one of them started, the rest of them will normally follow. And so our whole objective is to get the front started and then let the rest of them follow them. So we don't have to keep putting pressure on the ones in the back. The other one is they, uh, they do, and I think in Jesse's presentation, he had the cattle always want to return to where they came from. And that is kind of true, uh, but what they really want to do is to take pressure off. And so if you push them in the end of this bud box, for example, they're going to want to come back the way they came from. So if we're pushing on them from behind, they're objective is to take pressure off so they may actually come back over the top of us. So we have to be aware of that. And the last one, fifth one, is that they, uh, they can only think of one main thought at a time. They're kind of like a guy. Give us a task, let us do it. So if we start putting too much pressure in too many places, a lot of times we don't get things done. Now, <clears throat> here's the other part of this. If you give us a task, then guys, I'm gonna pick on us a little bit because it's so true. You know, stereotypes are, are based in fact and truth. Uh, if you give us a task that we don't really want to do, what happens? If you just say, go do that, we'll find something else to do that's a little more fun. All right? So you have to learn that if you want that unpleasant task done, you may have to remind us periodically, keep the pressure on us to get it done. That old joke, you know, tell your man to get something done, you don't have to remind him every six months it hadn't been done yet. That's his joke. You probably ought to do it more often if you want it done. So same thing on cattle. If we we're asking them to go down a chute and it's not something they really want to do, we've got to keep enough pressure on them to make them go ahead and commit and get it done. So the low stress handling and stockmanship is not about low pressure. It's about a lot of pressure at the right time to get the desired result. So keep that in mind. It's not about being slow and calm and singing kumbaya. It's about putting pressure when you need to to get the cattle to do what you need to do. Now these old calves are relaxed. They said this fool's just gonna stand over here and talk. He's not a big issue for us. So as I start over there, and they start getting up, I'm gonna stop when they start getting up. That's my first release of pressure. And I want all of them to get up, and then I'll go in the pen with them. But, oh bless his little heart, you gonna lay down right now. This one over here is pretty curious, but as I walk over here, they're, it's interesting, they're actually showing less response to me now than when I did when I came in the first time, because I've not been a threat to them, have I? 
So as I walk around here, and I'm going to do this from the outside, because once again that gives them a little bit of comfort zone, but I'll start putting the left pressure to get this calf up. And when I do, they'll probably walk by some others and get them up, but that's the first thing. And I'm just going to hold this pressure for a minute and see what they do. I'm, I'm trying to figure them out right now and see what kind of read I'm going to get off of them. If I stay right here, they're probably going to leave. And when they leave, that will get the rest of these cattle up. And I've already taught them to move off my pressure. Now, they may, if they don't, then I've got to go to them. Now, see, they've moved off enough they took the pressure off. But now I can move into them, start getting the rest of them up. And as I enter the pen, look how different the dynamic gets as soon as I unlock the latch. That's all I had to do for them to realize that things are about to, to change. So that right there was a pressure and release. That's the first lesson I want to teach them. Now look at them looking back here like, what's next? So if I stay back here, I can actually turn them around or if I walk over on this side, They'll probably turn to me. Look, they're all starting to look. They're going to start moving off. We've got one little short-eared one here that's going to be kind of fun. But I just want to stay, keep moving in here, and I'm going to send them back to the other side. I'm going to push them away from where I want them to go. Once they take that pressure, I'm going to back off so these will kind of come slower. And I want them to learn to go as a group. So if these don't go, I'll put more pressure. But they're going to go. So I don't have to do a whole lot to move my entire group of cattle. And I've just trained them to work as a group. Okay? So as they go down there and take the pressure off, I'll, I'll let them set for a minute. And then we'll go ask them to do something else. 